don't waste your life and don't waste your time and one of the ways that we can waste our lives is doing things that really are not important to God just to try to impress people you know why our motives are not what we're doing it's why we're doing what we're doing and guess what that's the only part God cares about how many of you have ever put together a jigsaw puzzle anybody has anybody ever done a real big one okay well God gave me this as an example a few years ago and I just love it you know when God speaks something to your heart gives you a dream or a vision to do something whether it's business or or ministry or whether you need a complete overhaul and you've got a vision of being the person God wants you to be you usually buy into what God shows you based on the picture you see <laughs> it's kind of like when you go out and buy a puzzle nobody looks in the box to see what the pieces look like you just get one that's got a good picture on the front of it no I have another one at home that I forgot to bring it's 5,000 pieces so we bought this one it's 2,000 pieces and if you notice most of this thing is green and blue <laughs> which means when you get into it there's a lot of sameness in the pieces however if you don't give up and you keep at it long enough you'll eventually get the puzzle put together then usually after you do it's not too long and you want to start something all over again so whatever vision and dream you have right now let me just tell you when you finally get to your destination it won't keep you satisfied too long and you'll be wanting to do some other thing because God has created us to want to reach and to grow and to do new things so the first thing I want to tell you and I want you to remember this make sure that you enjoy your journey because life is more about the journey than it is the destination now I want you to think about that when you get to wherever it is you think you want to be that's going to be a thrill and you're going to be thrilled for a while maybe a few days maybe a few weeks and it won't be long and you'll be reaching for something else and so if we don't learn how to enjoy the journey we can literally spend most of our lives being frustrated trying to get to where we think we want to be and it's really tragic when we don't enjoy the journey now admittedly some of it is a little more enjoyable than other things but everything is for a purpose and one of the things that's happening is we're getting experience and just like you go out and apply for a job they want to know what kind of experience you've got God wants us to come with a little bit of experience too we get different kinds of experiences we pray to love everybody but we don't want to have to love anybody that's not lovely <laughs> amen and it's easy to tell people how they need to forgive until somebody just gut wrenches you and then you have to try to do it yourself have you ever noticed how much easier it is to tell other people what to do than it is to do it yourself <laughs> one time I was in some kind of a situation and I was praying oh God show me what to do show me what to do God what do you want me to do he said just do what you would tell somebody else to do <laughs> and you'll be perfectly fine but anyway if you get the idea I'm trying to point out God's giving you a picture of something that he wants you to do like 40 years ago when God called me to teach the word all I really heard in my heart was you're going to go all over the world and teach my word and have a very large ministry well that was really kind of ridiculous I don't even know why it is we believe the things that God says to us except when he when he says something to you he also gives you a gift of faith to believe it now that's why a lot of times you can believe things for your life that nobody else can believe you get a gift of faith with it and so it seems very reasonable to you but other people are like ha, you, you gotta be kidding there's no way that you could do that and they just so it ends up being discouraging and so what happens then is when you open up this box oh my what have I gotten myself into 
Oh, Lord, have mercy. Do I really want to do this? You know, there's so many pieces to getting from where you are to where you want to be. And I want to see every one of you be somebody who doesn't just start, but you make it to the finish. John 17, 4, Jesus said, Glorify me, for I have completed the work that you have given me to do. One day years ago, I read that and I just started to weep and I thought, God, I want to be a finisher. I want to be a finisher. And so I just want to encourage you, it's good to be excited about starting. And I don't mean this to be discouraging, but you will get over being excited. <laughs> and there may be a few people now that are excited for you. They'll get over it too. <laughs> and the day will come when it's going to be you and God and the enemy trying to aggravate you. And you're going to have to decide if you really want to go all the way with God and do everything that he's asked you to do, or if you want to take the easy road and park somewhere and just stay there. Amen? Amen. We're going to go all the way through with God. I think there's probably, compared to the number of people that God gives a dream and a vision to, I think there's probably very few who actually finish and go all the way through. I think the greatest testimony I have, it's not surviving abuse, it's not this, that, something else. I think the greatest testimony I have is I'm still here. Amen. Amen. And when you can say that after 40 years, you know, when I started this, there, there were not arenas full of women that wanted to serve God. There was me and maybe two other ladies. And it was not a popular thing to do. And so I went through a lot of things that you guys won't have to go through. And let me tell you something, by the time you get from where you start to where you end up, there's a lot of things that you don't even really fully know how to explain to people that have happened between you and God. But you will be turned into a totally different person and God can use you in a great way if you just won't quit and give up. Amen. Let's all have a big praise for sticking with it. Now, you know, normally, normally we, and God even lets us do that. He'll let us do the easy stuff first. And so we usually put together the pieces that have got flat edges first. And we get an outline. And then you start. And see, if you were up here, you'd see everything here looks blue and green. Now, I don't know, you know, sometimes you ever get one of those pieces where you, you just... It just doesn't seem to fit anywhere. Has anybody in this room got a piece going on in your life right now that just doesn't seem to fit anywhere? Or maybe somebody's here, you're trying to make a piece fit somewhere. <laughs> and it just won't go. Is anybody here so fed up with putting together blue sky that you could just scream? You know, I worked at a church for five years and that was pretty good because the crowd came for the pastor and I got to preach and he believed for the money to pay the paychecks and I didn't have to do that and it was just a lot of fun. And then God called me to leave there and go north, south, east and west except nobody knew me north, south, east or west. And so trying to be childlike, I went to north St. Louis, east St. Louis, west St. Louis and south St. Louis. <laughs> And I did, and I started one, one teaching meeting once a month in each side of town. Well, for years and years and years and years, I did meetings of nine people and 12 people and 50 people and 60 people and 70 people. And man, if we got to 100, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I got so tired of putting together blue sky that I could have screamed at the top of my voice. Does anybody here feel like you've been stuck in the same place? doing the same thing so long that if God doesn't give you another piece pretty soon, you're going to feel like throwing the whole puzzle away. <laughs> Amen. All right, now, having said that, I want to read you something. I've kept journals for most of the 40 years that I've been in ministry, and usually one of the first things I do every day is write in my journal. And, you know, you'll tell your journal things that you don't want to tell anybody else. And then sometimes you go back and read them 20, 30 years later, they're actually pretty hysterical. 
And so I found this about a year ago, and I just decided that I would share it with a few people because it's, it, it's just interesting. So on December the 26th, 1987, so that's been 29 years ago, I said, Christmas is over, God is good. From a spiritual standpoint, I've been having a very rough time. A lot of things for a while that I've been saying, oh, well, cast your care, Joyce, everything's going to be okay. But today, everything just blew up in my face. Dave and I had a discussion that wasn't good. He feels I have to control everything or I'm not satisfied. I feel he's wrong and being unfair. Anybody got an entry like that anywhere? We have a hard time communicating when we differ in our opinions, but this was the last straw. And everything I've been feeling but casting my care about has now come tumbling in on top of me. So here it is. I've been having a hard time getting my messages, at least much harder than usual. I've been having a hard time hearing from God. I've been feeling very little anointing. It seems that the more I've pressed in in the spirit, the more God hides and requires me to go strictly on faith. I've just had a breast removed because I had cancer. Now I have two more surgeries to go for plastic surgery. Our meetings, at least the attendance, have fallen off because of the holiday season. I've had a lot of weird feelings, lazy mind, bored, discontent, etc. All of this has come at once. I also feel that I just don't know how to pray anymore. I've really had a hard time praying. How many of you could tell I was having a bad day? Well, today it just all seems to be too much. God help me, I feel like I'm gonna go under, but I guess I won't. I trust he's doing something, and that's in big letters, but I don't know what it is. He's probably, I guess, wanting a greater degree of abandonment out of me. I'm not sure I can do it, but I'm willing to let God do it if he can. Dave always feels I'm at fault and it's never him. And to be honest, that's just really hard on my flesh. But I don't suppose it matters much. It's all pride anyway. <laughs> now, now here, this is where it gets really funny. I am really sorry to have to report. <laughs> that, <laughs> that I have had to tell the Lord tonight that I have gone as far as I can go. <laughs> I have been telling him for two years, take me deeper if you want to. I'm willing to do whatever you need me to do, but I really don't want to go on like this. I feel I've gone as far as I can go. I want the pressure to let up, and I would also like a few feelings. <laughs> Come on, anybody with me out there? I don't know for sure if God's going to let me out of this. He may not let me out, but I never really thought I would back down. So now on top of everything else, I now find out that I am a spiritual coward. <laughs> you know, it's good sometimes to just be let into the real things that are going on in people's lives sometimes. Because if all people ever tell you who have victory is about their victory and they never tell you what it took to get there and how many times they wanted to give up and quit, then you begin to think that there's something wrong with you. But let me tell you something, everybody that's gonna do anything amazing with their life is going to have to go through some of the similar things. Everybody, there's nothing wrong with you, you're just in training. Now, 11 years later, I saw this entry. Somebody say 11 years. 11 years. And this was December the 20th, 1998. And I said, well, I was reading this old notebook and thought I would give you an update on how my life is now. <laughs> See, this is, this is what you got to look at. Things have changed drastically. I'm now on 375 television stations, 250 radio stations. Our ministry is very successful. I've changed drastically. I enjoy peace almost continually. I've continued all these years to have some health struggles, but in the midst of it all, God has given me grace to do all he's called me to do. It's been hard at times, but I can report that God is faithful. I now have four grandchildren, which now have become 11, plus one on the way. 
My youngest son was getting married in six weeks. He now has three sons of his own. Dave and I love each other very much and we get along really good almost all the time. <laughs> and in January, Dave and I will be married 50 years. Now, that's been 19 years ago and I won't bother to give you another update, but things are just really good. Now, what happened during those years? It's good to get a report here and then another one 11 years later, but what happened in those 11 years? And then what happened during the next 19 years? One main thing, I grew. <laughs> My ministry didn't grow all that much, but I grew. See, God is much more interested in changing us than he is in giving us what we want. I must repeat that. God is much more interested in changing us than he is giving us what we want. Now, you will eventually get what you want if what you want is what God wants. And you'll even come to the point where if what you want is not what God wants, you won't even want it. At least you'll tell God, I want this, but if it's not what you want, then I don't want you to give it to me. I beg God, please don't ever give me anything that I ask you for if it's not your will. Because I've been in the, in the will of God and I've been out and I can tell you in is much better than out. We all want to have a lot of fruit, but... However much fruit you have, you've got to have roots that go just that deep. And some of the stuff that goes on behind closed doors that nobody else knows about and nobody else would even understand, that's you getting rooted and grounded in the things that God wants you to be rooted and grounded in, like His love, confidence, knowing who you are as an individual, not needing to compare yourself with somebody else, not being a people pleaser. <laughs> I hope to get around to it later if time permits but if not I just want to say this now if you don't learn how to say no when you know that God is saying no you will kill yourself trying to keep other people happy all the time amen we need to live deeper lives and what I mean by that is we have this carnal level your soul is your mind your will and your emotions and it doesn't tell you anything about God it only tells you about you my mind tells me what I think my will tells me what I want and my emotions tell me how I feel but God wants us to live much deeper than that he wants us to learn to live in the spirit and to always be willing to go with God no matter what we want what we think or how we feel I want to go to Luke chapter 5 and show you a great scripture. Verse 1, Now it occurred that while the people pressed upon Jesus to hear the message of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two boats drawn up by the lake, but the fishermen had gone down from them and were washing their nets. And getting into one of the boats, the one that belonged to Peter, he said to him, draw, draw a little bit away from the shore. And then he sat down and he continued to teach the crowd of people. When he stopped speaking, he said to Peter, put out into the deep. Everybody say deep. deep. Put out into the deep and lower your nets for a haul. How many of you would like a haul in your life? Or whatever it is, whether it's a haul of peace or joy or success or whatever it is. We all would love to have a giant spiritual dump truck back up to our house <laughs> and just dump out everything on the driveway that we want. Come on out into the deep and get ready for a haul. And in verse 5, Peter said, Master, we toiled all night exhaustingly and we caught nothing in our nets. So what's he basically saying? He's saying, you don't get it, Jesus. We've already been out there. We didn't catch anything. 
We don't really feel like doing this. We don't think it's such a good idea and we don't believe it's going to work. But on the ground of your word, I will lower the nets again. Now, right there's the turning point. I don't want to do this. I don't feel like doing it. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's right. But if you say to do it, come on, are you there? If you say to do it, if you say to do it, then it doesn't matter what I want, what I think, or what I feel, your will be done and not mine. No matter how hard it is, no matter how much it hurts, has God ever asked you to do anything that just seems so totally unfair? I mean, like, so totally unreasonable. Most of you, if you're married, you know that men, <laughs> men are not very good at saying I was wrong. Matter of fact, some of them really stink at saying I was wrong. And they're not too quick to come and apologize. <laughs> and every time Dave and I would get into a tiff, God would tell me, now go make peace. Go make peace. And I finally said to the Lord one day, this is just not fair. It is not my turn. He, I apologize the last time, you need to talk to him. And, but you know, I could not find any scripture in the Bible that said make peace if it's your turn. And it just seemed to me like God was constantly dealing with me about something. And Dave was just happy and, you know, just going along and, I remember one day, I actually, I still remember where we were standing in the house, and I said to him, I thought, well, maybe God's dealing with, me, with him, and he's just not saying anything. So I said, is God dealing with you about anything? Because I really wanted God to be dealing with him about something. Do you know anybody in your life, you really are hoping God's dealing with them? And he looked kind of puzzled, and he said, well, I don't think so. And I would think, God, how can you not be dealing with him? He's got all these problems that you need to fix. And by the way, he is over there. He lets me pick on him all the time. And uh, let me tell you something. Dave is just the best guy. I mean, he, you know, real love is letting somebody be all that they can be. And Dave has definitely done that in my life. And he loves me just the way I am, including all my spice. And so I like that too. But anyway, man, I wanted God to deal with him and not just me. And it seems so unfair. I mean, I wanted him to come and say, you know, God's really been dealing with me that I need to treat you better. And God's really been dealing with me that, you know, I'm a little stubborn sometimes. And God's been dealing with me that I've got a problem with pride, but I never heard any of that. <laughs> never, never. I would just be getting my flesh crucified and he'd be out playing golf, having a good time. <laughs> and I remember murmuring to God one time because it seemed like I knew all kinds of people that did all kinds of things that I didn't feel like God would let me do. And I thought, I mean, really? I mean, God, are you really not dealing with them? Why do, they, why do they get to see movies like that and you won't let me see them? Why do they get to do this and you won't let me do it? And you know what he said to me? And somebody here today needs to hear this. He said, listen, Joyce, you've asked me for a lot. Do you want it or not? So here's the thing, and if you don't remember anything else I say today, please remember this. If you've asked God for a lot, if you've asked God to do a great work through you, then guess what? You don't get to compare yourself with what God is doing in anybody else's life. This is between you and Him. And there's probably going to be a lot of things that you're going to see other people get to do that you're not going to get to do. If you've asked God for a lot, do you want it? Or not. Amen? Amen. So he said, come on out in the deep and get ready for a haul. Well, master, we don't think it's going to work. We're exhausted. 
but on the ground of your word, I will lower the nets again. And verse 6 is so beautiful. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, so many that their nets were at the point of breaking, and they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and take hold with them. And they came and filled all the boats so that they all began to sink. So what's the message there? If we do what God wants us to do and we live a deeper life and we don't live according to what we want, what we think and what we feel, then we will have a hall of blessings in our life, not only for ourselves, but so much that we'll be able to help all the people around us that are needy. Is that what you want? All right. Well, what happens when we begin to grow? Well, we learn to live deeper. We learn to seek God for who He is and not just what He can do for us. Man, was that ever a big transition in my life. One morning when I was praying, the Lord challenged me to take a real good look at, my, at how I was praying and compare how I was praying to the way the Apostle Paul prayed and the way Jesus prayed. And by the time I got done, I was quite embarrassed because all I did was ask for stuff for the flesh and I don't know if you know it or not, but in all the prayers that Paul prayed for the church, you can't find one where he asked God to give them a thing or to relieve them from any of the things they were going through. He prayed that they would be able to endure whatever came with a good temper. I've never yet had anybody come and say, Joyce, would you pray for me that I can go through whatever I need to go through and still stay sweet and happy? <laughs> never once in 40 years has anybody asked me to pray that. But we need to be able to pray, God, I want your will in my life. And if it's not comfortable, then keep me sweet and keep me happy because I just want to do this the way you would do it if you were here. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All right. So we have to stop seeking God for just what he can do for us and seek him for who he is. During those years, my motives were purified. And you know, I don't know about you, but I think most of us, if we were really gut level honest, we would have to say that when we first start, first start wanting to be used by God, our motives are not all that stellar. I had been abused by my dad and so I was very insecure. And to be honest, although I had a call on my life, part of me wanted to do it because I felt like I was being called to do it, but part of it wanted me to do it because I just wanted to be successful at something so I could feel good about myself. I can't stand here and tell you that day one, all I wanted to do was help other people. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to be in leadership. I wanted to be one of the important people at my church. I wanted to have my name on a seat. I wanted to have an office with my name on the door. And I wanted all of those things for the wrong reasons. Now that didn't mean I wasn't called, but it did mean that God had to do a work of purification in my life to get me to the point where, for every, where everything I was doing was being done, number one, in obedience to him, and number two, to help people. And that takes a while. How many of you know what I mean when I'm talking about motives? Let me, let me just give you a homework assignment. I'll never know if you did it or not, but just pretend like you're going to. <laughs> Sometime when this is over and you have some quiet time at home, write down everything that you spend your time doing and then go back and ask yourself why you're doing it. <laughs> Everybody gets quiet at this point. <laughs> I mean, it is amazing how quiet people get when you start talking about motives. You know why our motives are not what we're doing, it's why we're doing what we're doing. And guess what? That's the only part God cares about. He's not impressed by our big ministries or our friends on Facebook or this or that or anything else. The only thing he's concerned about is why are you doing what you're doing? And you know, 1 Corinthians 3.13 says that the work of each one of us will become plainly and openly known, shown for what it is, for the day of Christ will disclose and declare it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test and critically appraise the character and the worth of the work that each person has done. And it goes on to say that if what we've done is a pure work, we'll get our reward, 
And if not, all the works will be burned up, even though we ourselves will still be saved. I don't know about you, but I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to spend my life with some misconceived, deceptive idea that I'm doing everything I'm doing for God when really a lot of it is just for myself. I read this the other day and I thought this was a great statement. The biggest thing to be afraid of is not failure. The biggest thing to be afraid of is that we will succeed at something that's useless. I think we could say that again, right? The biggest thing to be afraid of is not failure. The biggest thing to be afraid of is that we might succeed at something useless. I just wrote a book released at last fall called Seize the Day. And in that book, I tried to share with people how important it is to live your life on purpose for a purpose. I don't think any of us can realize how valuable time is until you get old enough in life to where you're not having too much of it left. You think totally differently when you're 20 and 30 and 40 and even 50 and 60. And I can tell you when I was in my 60s, I realized one day two thirds of my life was over. Even if I lived to be in my mid 90s, two thirds of it was over. And I only had about a third left. And I tell you, I really have a passion to tell people don't waste your life and don't waste your time. And one of the ways that we can waste our lives is doing things that really are not important to God just to try to impress people. Amen? Now, I know that talking about motives gets people kind of somber, so we'll go on and talk about something else now. <laughs> Thank you. During that period of time, we also have the privilege of having a lot of humility worked into our lives. The Bible says, humble yourself into the mighty hand of God, but I can tell you that if you don't humble yourself, God will do it for you. And it's much more painful when he does it than if we go ahead and do it. I don't know if you're willing to admit it or not, but I think most of us when we start are pretty full of ourselves. <laughs> Anybody? Come on, don't look so innocent. I'm here. I've only been a month since I had my hip sawed in half. I'm here to help you, so look like you're being helped. See, I like to get into the deeper stuff because I just don't think we've got a lot of time to mess around. Amen? Amen. Nebuchadnezzar the king, Daniel 4, 1 through 4. This is such a good story. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all the people, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, may peace be multiplied to you. Verse 2, it seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed toward me. Now, I want you to notice that in the beginning of this chapter, he's given God all the credit. Look what God's done. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. And I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and prospering in my palace. You see, as long as we're giving God the credit, we have rest and we have peace. Now, I don't know what happened to poor Nebuchadnezzar, but somehow in 26 verses, he fell completely apart. And I don't really know how long 26 verses takes in the Bible, but it didn't take me very long to read it. And by the time we get around to verse 30, the king said, is not this the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence and the seat of government by the might of my power and for the honor and the glory of my majesty? <laughs> wow. You see, success can be dangerous. Yes, I said success can be dangerous. Because there's always a danger that we might begin to think that we actually had something to do with it. 
or even worse than that. And I think God hates this the most. We might begin to think that we're actually better than other people. And then if we're not very careful, we'll begin to mistreat other people that we don't think are quite as important as we are. We're not very useful to God if we don't beg Him to work in our lives to keep us humble. No matter, and nothing hurts worse than having God deal with your pride. I used to have a series on my table called Pride and Humility. I finally realized that nobody was gonna buy that. <laughs> so I have gotten very good at hiding my messages under other titles. <laughs> How to succeed with God. <laughs> Five ways to find promotion. <laughs> and I do that, I really do. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. Let me tell you something. It takes a lot longer to build something up than it does for God to tear it down. We all beg God for big things. I did. And I love to share this with the people that are in leadership I remember when the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, I just want you to remember that however many people you can help, that's exactly how many you can hurt. That's why leadership is such a huge responsibility. Not just a privilege, but a responsibility. Because people watch everything you do. Amen? I went to a store the other day, and of course, being on television, I get recognized a lot. And not that I have any desire to do this, but I absolutely cannot afford to get out in public and not live what I preach. And I was actually pretty tired the other day because of the hip thing. And I was out doing a little bit of shopping. I just wanted to get out for a while, and it happened to be a heavy everybody knows Joyce day. And so, <laughs> and I mean, and probably the thing I like the least happened, a man ran up and, oh, can I call my sister? Will you talk to my sister? I'm like, mm, I, I really don't like to do the phone call thing. Oh, well, yeah, and he wasn't gonna take no for an answer, so he got his sister on the phone. I remember one person who did that and when I told the person on the phone, hi, this is Joyce Meyer. They're like, who's that? <laughs> Please don't make me call people that don't even know me. <laughs> and so, so now here, but here's what I said to somebody that was with me. I said, you know what? I just need to go home. I said, here's why. This is obviously going to be a busy day, and I don't feel good, and I'm likely to be cranky. <laughs> and I cannot afford to do that, so it's best if I just go. <laughs> Amen? See, when you're leading other people, if it's, a, if it's a church, if it's a Bible study, whatever it is, if you're the president of some club at school, whatever it is, the minute that you're in a place of leadership, people look up to you and they expect and need you to be the real deal. Now, that doesn't mean we don't make mistakes, but it does mean that we must press in and continue growing and not just make excuses for bad behavior because we can get by with it. Amen? However many people you can help, that's exactly how many you can hurt. Anyway, I went to the store the other day and guy working behind the little deli counter, he's probably waited on me at least seven times and never said one word. I mean, that, you know, that he knew me. And that day he said, my wife watches you all the time. 
you think you could sign something for her? So I had somebody bring a couple of books back to him, but I thought now, what about in those seven times <laughs> if I would have been cranky, if I would have been rude, if I would have said anything that would have not made him believe that I was the real deal. There's a lot of responsibility to leadership. We were in a restaurant one time after I'd taught a whole seminar. I'd done four or five different sessions by myself and we made a plan to go to this certain restaurant and eat. We had a bunch of people with us and we called and made a reservation only to find out when we got there that they didn't take reservations. I'm like, well, why didn't you tell us that when we made the reservation? <laughs> and, well, you must have just talked to somebody that didn't know, and oh, we're sorry, they made a mistake, and so you're going to have to wait about 45 minutes to an hour, and I was like, <laughs> God, I have worked all weekend. I don't want to wait 45 minutes to an hour, but praise the Lord. <laughs> so we finally get seated, and it's very crowded in the restaurant that day, and we've got about 12 people at our table. And the waitress is balancing this thing of drinks that we had ordered, coffee, tea, all kinds of stuff. And she tripped on something and dumped the whole thing on my husband. <laughs> well, Dave, you know, he's, he doesn't have the challenges that I do in personality. <laughs> and he just said, that's okay. Don't worry about it. He even called the manager over and said, no, nah, I don't want her to get in trouble. It wasn't her fault. And so she comes back about 20 minutes later with another tray of drinks. And she sets them on the table and she leans across the table and she looks at me and she said, I was just so nervous because I know who you are. And I thought, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you that I didn't act like an idiot. Come on, somebody's always watching. And if it's not a person, it's God. And we need to learn to live under that one all-seeing eye and realize that we are not hiding anything from Him. We may hide from other people, but we're not hiding anything from Him. Amen. Now, something else that happens to us is we have what... I fondly call silent years. <laughs> you know what those years are? Those are the years when you've got this thing in your heart, not much is happening. Nobody's really for you, nobody really believes you. It's just kind of a thing between you and God. And somehow or another in these silent years when nothing's happening, you're supposed to hang on to this dream. Anybody in those times right now maybe in your life? It's good to know I don't have the wrong crowd. <laughs> well, let me just tell you that everybody has them. There are years when God hides you and all he does is work on you. <laughs> Amen. All he does is work on you. Moses spent 40 years in the desert. He went in running ahead of God and came out with reverential fear. <laughs> Joseph spent 13 years from the time he was sold as a slave until he became the prime minister. He was 17 years old when he was sold and 30 when he became prime minister. During that time, he was repeatedly, repeatedly tested. You talk about somebody that had some unfair things happen to him. See, God never told us that life is fair. He just said that he is a God of justice. And that means eventually God will make all wrong things right. Amen. David spent 20 years after he was anointed to be king before he wore the crown. And the whole time he was tormented by Saul who kept trying to kill him. John the Baptist was in the wilderness 12 to 15 years. And I don't have time to read all this, but it goes all through it, starting in verse 76. And at the end, it says, he grew. <laughs> I 
really? He grew. But you know what? If you've been there and done that, then you get it. It's like, I can feel the pain in those two words. He grew. All those years out there. Matter of fact, I've got the statistics. 30 years of preparation for a ministry that lasted a few months. John the Baptist. 30 years of preparation for a ministry that lasted a few months. And then Jesus was born and at eight days old, he was brought to the temple for dedication. He wasn't heard from again until he was 12 years old. <laughs> kind of sounds like my journal. <laughs> you don't hear, don't hear anything again from the age of 12 to 30. And all the Bible says is he grew. <laughs> he grew. Hmm. Then suddenly after that, he was baptized. The Holy Spirit came on him and he started his public ministry with power. Let me tell you something. If you will let God do what he wants to do in your life, your day will come. And you won't be promoting yourself. God will be promoting you. And what God lifts up, no man can bring down. Amen. Don't ever try to put yourself in a position. Wait and let God put you. Something the Lord spoke to my heart many years ago. He said, whatever you start in the flesh, you will maintain in the flesh. So we don't want to be trying to start stuff just because we can. We want to make sure that what's going on in our life is God. I want to encourage you that everything, everything that I've been through, which is a lot, has been so worth it. And even though I tell you these difficult things that you're going to have to make it through, it's not meant at all to be discouraging. It's meant to encourage you not to quit and not to give up because God needs you. And he's preparing you for something amazing. And I compliment you for being hungry for the Word of God and for being willing to step up and live a sacrificial life. Don't you dare quit. Don't you give up. When you don't understand, just remember that God's always got a purpose in everything. And I don't mean this just to be glib, but all things do work together for good to those who love God and really want His will in their lives. Come on, you're going to make it, and you're going to do great things for God.